This is the longest entry of the book, Tuesday, April 11th, 1944. Dear Kitty, my head throbs. I honestly don't know where to begin. On Friday, Good Friday, we played Monopoly, Saturday afternoon too. These days pass quickly and uneventfully. On Sunday afternoon, on my invitation, Peter came to my room at half past four. At a quarter past five, we went to the front attic where we remained until six o'clock. There was a beautiful Mozart concert on the radio from six o'clock until a quarter past seven. I enjoyed it all very much, but especially the Klein Nacht music. I can hardly listen in the room because I'm always so inwardly stirred when I hear lovely music. On Sunday evening, Peter and I went to the front attic together, and in order to sit comfortably, we took with us a few divan cushions that we were able to lay our heads on. We seated ourselves on one packing case. Both the case and the cushions were very narrow, so we sat absolutely squashed together, leaning against the other cases. Mucci kept us company, too, so we weren't very unchaperoned. <laughs> the cat was the chaperone. Suddenly, at a quarter to nine, Mr. Van Dan whistled and asked if we had one of Dussel's cushions. We both jumped up and went downstairs with cushion, cat, and Van Dan. A lot of trouble arose out of the, this cushion because Dussel was annoyed that he had one of his cushions, one that he used as a pillow. He was afraid that there might be fleas in it and made a great commotion about his beloved cushion. Peter and I put two hard brushes in his bed as a revenge. We had a good half laugh over this interlude. Our fun didn't last long. At half past nine, Peter knocked softly on the door and asked Danny if he would just help him upstairs over a difficult English sentence. That's a blind, I said to Margo. Anyone could see through that one. I was right. They were in the act of breaking into the warehouse. Daddy, Van Dan, Dussel, and Peter were downstairs in a flash. Margo, Mummy, Mrs. Van Dan, and I stayed upstairs and waited. Four frightened women just have to talk, so talk we did, until we heard a bang downstairs. After that, all was quiet. The clock struck a quarter to ten. The color had vanished from our faces. We were still quiet. Although we were afraid, we c where could the men be? What was that bang? Would they be fighting the burglars? Ten o'clock, footsteps on the stairs. Daddy, white and nervous, entered, followed by Mr. Van Den. Lights out, creep upstairs. We expect the police in the house. There was no time to be frightened. The lights went out. I quickly grabbed a jacket and we went upstairs. What has happened? Tell us quickly. There was no one to tell us, the men having disappeared downstairs again. Only at ten past ten did they reappear. Two kept watch at Peter's open window. The door to the landing was closed, the swinging cupboard shut. We hung a jersey round the nightlight, and after that they told us. Peter heard two loud bangs on the landing, ran downstairs, and saw that there was a large plank out of the left house of the door. He dashed upstairs, warned the home guard of the family, and the four of them proceeded downstairs. When they entered the warehouse, the burglars were in the act of enlarging the hole. Without further thought, Mr. Van Dan shouted, Police! A few hurried steps outside and the burglars had fled. In order to avoid the hole being noticed by the police, a plank was put against it, but a good hard knock from outside sent it flying to the ground. The men were perplexed at such imprudence, and both Mr. Van Dan and Peter felt murder welling up within them. Van Dan beat on the ground with a chopper and all was quiet again. Once more they wanted to pull the plank in front of the hole. Disturbance. A married couple outside shone a torch through opening, lighting up the whole warehouse. Hell, muttered one of the men, and now they switched over from the role of police to that of burglars. The four of them sneaked upstairs. Peter quickly opened the door and windows of the kitchen and private office, flung the telephone over the cupboard, and finally the four of them landed behind the swinging cupboard. End of part one. So there was actual burglars there, and they were like, police! And then they were trying to cover up the burglar's hole, and, then, and another couple walked by and thought that they were burglars. End of part one. The married, the married couple thought they were burglars. The married couple with the torch would probably have warned the police. It was Sunday evening, Easter Sunday, no one at the office on Easter Monday, so none of us could bulge until Tuesday morning. Think of it, waiting in such fear for two nights and a day. No one had anything to suggest, so we simply sat there in pitch darkness because Mrs. Van Dan, in her fright, had unintentionally turned the lamp right out, talked in whispers, and at every creak one heard, shh, shh. It turned half past ten, eleven, but not a sound. Daddy and Van Den joined us in turns. Then at quarter past eleven, a bustle and noise downstairs. Everyone's breath was audible, otherwise nobody moved. Footsteps in the house, in the private office, kitchen, then in our staircase. No one breathed audibly now. Footsteps on our staircase, then a rattling of the swinging cupboard. This moment is indescribable. Now we are lost, I said, and could see us being taken away by the Gestapo. And that was, and, and that very, taken by the, sorry, I got to this, taken by the Gestapo that very night. Twice they rattled at the cupboard. Then there was nothing. The footsteps withdrew. We were saved so far. A shiver seemed to pass from one to another. I heard someone's teeth chattering. No one said a word. 
There was not another sound in the house, but a light was burning on our landing, right in front of the cupboard. Could that be because it was a secret cupboard? Perhaps the police had forgotten the light. Would someone come back to put it out? Tongues loosened. There was no one in the house any longer. Perhaps there was someone on guard outside. Next, we did three things. We went over again what was supposed to happen. We trembled with fear, and we had to go to the lavatory. The buckets were in the attic, so all we had was Peter's tin waste bucket, waste paper basket. Van Dan went first, then Daddy, but Mommy was too shy to face it. Daddy brought the waste basket into the room, where Margot, Mrs. Van Dan, and I gladly made use of it. Finally, Mommy decided to do so too. People kept on asking for paper. Fortunately, I had some in my pocket. The tent smelled ghastly. Everything went on in a whisper. We were tired. It was 12 o'clock. Lie down on the floor, then in sleep. Margot and I were each given a pillow and one blanket. Margot lying just near the stove cupboard and I between the table legs. The smell wasn't quite as bad when one was on the floor, but still, Mrs. Van Den quietly, quietly brought some chlorine, a tea towel, over the pot, serving as a second expedient. Talk, whispers, fear, stink, fluctuation, and always someone on the pot, then try to go to sleep. However, by half past two, I was so tired that I knew no more until half past three. I awoke when Mrs. Van Den laid her head on my foot. For heaven's sake, give me something to put on, I asked. I was given something, but don't ask what. A pair of wooden knickers over my pajamas, a red jumper and a black skirt, white overstocks and a pair of sports stockings full of holes. Then Mrs. Van Dan sat in the chair and her husband came and lay on my feet. I lay thinking till half past three, shivering the whole time, which prevented Mr. Van Dan from sleeping. I prepared myself for the return of the police. Then we'd have to say we were in hiding. That would either be good... They would either be good Dutch people, then we'd be saved, or NSBers, then we'd have to bribe them. In that case, destroy the radio, signed Mrs. Van Dan. Yes, in the stove, replied her husband. If they find us, then let them find the radio as well. Then they'll find Anne's diary, added Daddy. Burn it, then, suggested the most terrified member of the party. This, and when the police rattled the cupboard doors, were the, my most worst moments. Not my diary. If my diary goes, I go with it. But luckily, Daddy didn't answer. There is no object to recounting all the conversations that I can still remember. So much was said. I confronted Mrs. Van Dan, who was very scared. We talked about escaping and being questioned by the Gestapo, about ringing up and being brave. We must behave like soldiers, Mrs. Van Dan. If all is up now, then let's go for queen and country, for freedom, truth, and right, as I always say in the Dutch news from England. The only thing that is really rotten is that we get a lot of other people into trouble, too. Mr. Van Dan changed places again with his wife after an hour, and Daddy came and sat beside me. The men smoked nonstop. Now and then there was a deep sigh, and then someone went on the pot, and everything began all over again. Four o'clock, five o'clock, half past five. Then I went and sat with Peter by his window and listened, so close together that we could feel each other's bodies quivering. We spoke a word or two now and then and listened attentively in the room next to ours that they took down the blackout. They wanted to call up Kahoopies at 7 o'clock and get him to send someone around. Then they wrote down everything they wanted to tell Kahoopies over the phone. The risk that the police on guard at the door or in the warehouse might hear the telephone was very great, but the danger of the police returning was even greater. The points were these. Burglars broke in. Police had been in the house, as far as the swing cupboard, but no further. Burglars apparently disturbed, forced to open the door in the warehouse and escaped through the garden. Main entrance bolted. Crailer must have used the second door when he left. The typewriters and adding machines are safe in the black case in the private office. Try to warn Hank and fetch the key from Ellie, then go and look around the office or the pretext of feeding the cat, on the pretext of feeding the cat. Everything went according to plan. Copias was phoned, the typewriters which we had upstairs were put in the case, then we sat around the table again and waited for Hank or the police. Peter had fallen asleep and Van Dan and I were lying on the floor when we heard loud footsteps downstairs. I got up quietly. That's Hank. No, no, it's the police, some of the others said. Someone knocked on the door. Mike whispered. This was too much for Mrs. Van Dan. She turned as white as a sheet and sank limply into a chair. Had the tension lasted one minute longer, she would have fainted. Our room was a perfect picture when Mike Hank entered. The table alone would have been worth photographing. A copy of cinema and theater covered with jam and a remedy for diarrhea opened at a page of dancing girls, two jam pots, two startled loaves of breads, a mirror, comb, matches, ash, cigarettes, tobacco, ashtray, books, a pair of pants, a torch, toilet paper, etc., lay jumbled together in very variegated splendor. Of course, Hank and Mike were greeted with shouts and tears. Hank mended the hole in the door with some planks and soon went off again to inform the police of the burglary. Mike had also found a letter under the warehouse door from the night watchman, Slagder, who had noticed the hole and had warned the police for whom he, he would also visit. 
So we had half an hour to tidy ourselves. I'd never seen such a change take place in half an hour. Margaret and I took the bedcloths downstairs, sent to the WC, washed and did our teeth and hair. After that, I tidied the room a bit and went upstairs again. The table there was already cleared, so we ran off some water and made coffee and tea, boiled the milk, and laid the table for lunch. Daddy and Peter emptied the potties and cleaned them with warm water and chlorine. At 11 o'clock, we sat down around the table with Hank, who was back at that time, and slowly things began to be more normal and cozy again. Hank's story was as follows. Mr. Slider was asleep, but his wife told Hank that her husband had found the hole in our door when he was doing his tour around the canals, and that he had called a policeman who had gone through the building with him. He would be coming to see Crayler on Tuesday, and would tell him more then. As the police station, they knew nothing of the burglary yet, but the policeman had made a note of it once and would come back and look around on Tuesday. <clears throat> that was part one. Part two will be coming up.